Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to this great mosque open day on this scorching day. Uh, it's a very hot day, uh, but uh, you have made uh, honored all of us for this institution for coming here. Um, when we talk about Muslims and Islam, uh, one of the first things that comes to mind, uh, our mind is terrorism, jihad, radicalization, suicide bombing, and lately uh, with this ISIS problem in Syria, beheadings. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't avoid these things. Uh, when I, I, I am a Muslim, I'm a practicing Muslim, like all other uh, moderate practicing uh, reasonable Muslims out there, whenever I see images in the media, I say, oh, not again. Another again, another Muslim somewhere in the world has done uh, an atrocity, an abhorrent act that will be unavoidably associated with this time and Muslims. And we're going to have to work for years to remove the tarnish that that act made uh, severe in the face of this time and Muslims. So it's an uphill, uphill battle for us. Uh, and it, it came to like this, gives us an opportunity to explain these things uh, and to tell you that uh, Islam as a religion and the great majority of Muslims have nothing to do with these things. Um, but I just want to say at the outset, on behalf of this institution, myself, and I think I'm speaking for all Muslims in this country, or great majority, uh, and when I say great majority, it's 99.99% uh, who condemn any of these atrocities done in the name of Islam, uh, claiming to do it under Islamic Caliphate or Islamic State or an organization, or in the name of God, Allah, uh, are committing great acts of crime against humanity. And we condemn it in the strongest terms, in the strongest words possible. Uh, I just want to say that right at the start. Uh, I am ashamed of what they're doing, and I believe that these people, as some scholars have said, get out of Islam by doing these acts, when they associate with believing that it is Islamic what they're doing. So, what, then how come they are able to do this? And how come they are able to uh, call on Islamic references when they are doing these acts? Obviously, uh, the international conflicts uh, around the world are complex, and there are many reasons why people may be engaging on these things. But what I want to inform you about today is, uh, firstly, what value Islam gives to life, human life. Uh, secondly, I want to explain to you the concept of jihad, because jihad is a, is a very important Islamic term, which is often used in connection with these uh, actions. Uh, and thirdly, I want to explain why some Muslims would engage in terrorism. Um, even though uh, killing of civilians is un Islamic. And if you have, I'm sure I won't be covering everything, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me at the end. Um, so Islam and human life. You know, Islam, uh, when we say Islam, what we mean is the Quran as the written book, revealed book, uh, that Muslims see as scriptures uh, that has been revealed by God, word by word. So Muslims believe that. And the second very important source for Islam of Muslims is prophetic sayings or traditions. The sayings and actions that are attributed to Prophet Muhammad, this be upon him. So when we say how Islam treats human life, we have to go back to these sources. So what we find is that uh, the Quran tells us that human being is created in the best possible composition. Um, and that a uh, human being is uh, created with a capacity to do good and to recognize goodness. 
and that human being is created in an honored spiritual, mental uh, position and sent, sent down to earth with a trust. The Quran talks about uh, an important trust given to human beings. It doesn't say what it is, and that, that's what makes it interesting, and you can interpret that. Uh, but trust means uh, you trust something that is valuable uh, onto other people. So human being, uh, God trusts human beings to carry these important things uh, in our lives on earth. And also human being is created as a care caretaker, caliph. The word caliph appears in the Quran and it means a vicegerent caretaker who can act uh, in the name of God, but with responsibility and accountability, of course. But the thing is that uh, while we have all these fantastic, uh, honorable attributes, we also carry with us a destructive side for ourselves. And in Islamic terminology, this is called nafs, the human egotistical self which always commands evil. So our struggle in this life is to actually uh, overcome these negative inclinations, the anger, the hatred, jealousy, whatever negative uh, emotions we may have, to overcome them and develop as a good person. Because of all of this, the Quran declares that killing of all hum killing of a single person unjustly is like killing of all humanity. And saving the life of a person is like saving the life of all humanity. So human life, a single human life, is equated with the lives of all human beings on this planet. This is a great thing to say, uh, and it goes against any rationale that individual lives could be sacrificed for the benefit of the whole. It doesn't work that way in Islamic ethics. Um, and uh, a very important aspect of Islamic law is that number one is to protect human life. Like There are five basic rights. Uh, that are God-given naturally to all human beings to a uh, right to live, right to own property, right to have family, uh, right to have a free mind, and, and freedom of religion. So these five basic rights have to be safeguarded by governments and they cannot be changed by laws that, that make up themselves. And life is number one. And life is so important that even prohibitions of God can be lifted temporarily uh, to save human life. Like for, you might know that uh, alcohol is prohibited in Islam. Uh, but if alcohol is going to save life or be used as a medicine, then you can have alcohol until that necessity is lifted and your, your life is saved. So this is very important. Uh, like the principle of necessity cannot be used to end lives. It can only be used to save lives. So saving lives is the highest objective uh, in Islam. Okay, let's now let me look at what jihad jihad mean. Uh, the word jihad does not mean war. There's another word for that. But jihad means to struggle and to strive. If there's a student who's studying hard to pass the exam, they are making jihad. Uh, but in the Islamic terms, the word has assumed religious connotations. And it means, in its general definition, a personal struggle that one has to do, do in order to achieve a good outcome uh, before adverse circumstances. So it's a personal struggle to achieve a good outcome in adverse circumstances. The jihad cannot be done uh, for a bad outcome. Like you have the movie uh, Ocean's Eleven. They work very hard to steal money from the casino. Right? They make, uh, they're not making jihad, they're stealing. <laughs> They're working hard, I mean, they have to give it to them, they really come up with this 
fantastic uh, plan. Uh, and the movie makes you, everyone who watches that movie goes for the thieves. Because they're stealing from uh, the casino. It's a Robin Hood mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, so jihad has to be for a good cause. And, uh, you know, isn't this life? Like, we all struggle in life. Uh, some of us struggle more than others. But life is about that. There's no gain without pain. It's a very important maxim in, in our life, in social life. Um, jihad does not mean holy war. Uh, there is another, the war in Arabic means harp. And uh, if you translate holy war, it's harp al muqaddasa and then this word, this expression, appears nowhere in the Quran or in prophetic sayings. It was actually, uh, it is actually unholy to wage war against people. Um, but there is a place for military engagement in the concept of jihad, and I want to explain that uh, by uh, holding on to the three dimensions of jihad. The first one is uh, is the spiritual struggle, you know, uh, that, that every individual must make in their personal lives. I touched on that, um, and that's the hardest one to do. You know, it's very easy to criticize people, but it's very difficult to change yourself, isn't it? Usually, we can see what wrong other people do, and we can give them advice that you should do this like this. But when it comes to ourselves, it's very ch hard to change habits, uh, and people, a lot of people do wrong things knowingly, and we tend to rationalize why it's okay to do these things, and uh, we give ourselves reasons why it's okay to smoke. We all know smoking kills on the packets. So there is a spiritual struggle or inner struggle that we all have to do. There is also social activism. Uh, that's part of jihad as well. Uh, if we see something wrong in society and then we organize ourselves to peacefully uh, correct that, to end that and improve the lives of people, that is also jihad. So if a Muslim joins up uh, an organization that struggle, struggles against environmental destruction, that is a jihad. And I really strongly believe that uh, God will reward a person if they do it with that intention. Um, studying, uh, opening up schools uh, in our mosques, places where people can gather together and then have a sense of belonging and get education, building these institutions are also jihad and goes down to that social activism. And finally, there is the third one, uh, which is a just war uh, concept. So if, if a, a jihad, if a warfare is jihad, then it must have a just cause. It must have a right purpose. And this also exists in the Christian sort of theology as well. Uh, another a very important distinction in jihad is the greater and lesser jihad. Like one day, uh, Prophet Muhammad was coming from a battle, which was the, you know, what could be greater than that? You, you just, you, there's an enemy who attacks you, and you, you're defending yourself, uh, you're risking your life, uh, and uh, what can be greater than that? And he says that we are coming, returning from lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And people said, what can be greater than this? And he said, uh, struggle with yourself. The, the inner, that spiritual struggle that I have talked about, of Muhammad called that the greater jihad. Now, uh, obviously when we talk about war and religion, uh, the, the two doesn't mix usually. And we know that. But we will, next year in April, we will go through our Anzac celebrations. We celebrate uh, Anzac throughout the nation. What do we normally talk about in this in that context? We say 
Well, they have paid the ultimate sacrifice to defend their country. They are heroes. Uh, so we celebrate people who gave their lives away in conflicts around the world because we think that those conflicts were justified. There were good reasons to enter into them. So that's the kind of the only way that uh, warfare or military engagement could be justified in a, in a religious state, a context as well. But I will talk about uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad also said the real warrior is the one who fights his own self by obeying God's commands. And uh, he advised a man who was seeking to join the army and he said to start his jihad by serving his parents. He had elderly parents. Uh, and that, that's a hard thing to do. I, I just had my mother had stroke and I got to look after her uh, to, together with other family members and I know how hard it is. So, uh, a man wanted to know a better form of jihad from the Prophet and he said to say the truth in front of an oppressive ruler. Uh, try saying that uh, before a dictator. You know, you're risking your life even more readily than being engaged in warfare. Perhaps in war you have a chance to survive, but before a dictator, probably uh, not much chance of survival. So the difference between harp and jihad, jihad is war with a just cause, harp is any war, especially belligerent ones. Now, uh, as Dr. Saleh Hujan did an analysis of the Quran, uh, this is a content analysis, just to see how much certain words appear. Uh, peace appears 67 times, war appears 39 times. And out of those 39 times, it's always condemning warfare. And peace is encouraging peace. Mercy 202 times, fighting 52 times. And, and so on, you know, and so the Quran is dominated. God's mercy and compassion is dominated in the Quran. So why does the Quran talk about warfare? Um, because it is necessity. There will be people who will attack you, uh, and you want to know whether you can defend yourself. And if you can defend yourself, what are the rules of engagement? <coughs> what can you do and what can't you do? And this is the verse that was first revealed that allowed Muslims to uh, have war. By the way, uh, I don't know, if you read Prophet Muhammad's life, this book on him, uh, his mission lasts for about 23 years. And for the first 14 years of that, the Muslims could not, they were prohibited by Quran not to engage in any uh, violence or war, even if it was defensive. So even if it was defensive. Only when they establish a kind of a government and a, a social and political organization in Medina, when they migrated there and, uh, and the enemies were attacking, they were allowed to fight. And this is a fantastic verse because it gives reasons why fighting is allowed. And it says, the, belief, the believers against whom war is waged are given permission to fight in response for what they have been wronged. Surely God has full power to help them to victory for those who have been driven from their homeland against all right. For no other reason that they, uh, they said, our Lord is God. So uh, Muslims have been removed from their homes, and their possessions have been confiscated, and they had to migrate to somewhere else as refugees. So in a way, uh, if, you, if your homeland is occupied, and people are just out there to kill you because you believe differently, or you are you're different people, uh, you can defend yourself. Uh, if in this uh, in this way, and look, look, this one is very very important. Were it not for God's repelling some people by means of others, monasteries and churches and synagogues and mosques, where God is regularly worshipped and His name is much mentioned, would surely have been pulled down. 
It's not just talking about mosques. It's talking about synagogues, monasteries, churches. It's about freedom of religion. So it's a very important uh, uh, thing. Freedom is important. So anyone that impinges on that, then we have a right to defend ourselves. If we don't defend these important freedoms and rights, what happens is some treacherous people who have no qualms about uh, aggression, uh, tyranny, and oppression will come and impose uh, violence uh, and oppression on people. So we have to defend our rights. However, this, there are conditions for all of this, of course. Like you, you can't, people, some people can take this as an open license to, I'm just going to go and fight everybody. No. There are important uh, guidelines. Uh, so, these are all from the Quran. Muslims uh, cannot be aggressors. Um, there are people who are exempt from fighting, civilians, very important. Civilians are exempt from fighting. So, warfare can only be done against an army, an organized army. Uh, the Quran talks about uh, the treatment, good treatment of prisoners, no torturing, uh, proportional use of force, limits of force, who can declare a war and when, and also that with all of that, peace is preferred. It's better if you, if you don't fight at all. A Prophet Muhammad said when he was sending a, a, a battalion, he said, make sure uh, don't kill civilians, don't kill livestock, don't touch monasteries or places of worship, and don't hope that you meet your enemy. So if, if you can avoid it, just avoid warfare. Uh, okay. So we talked about that. So ultimately peace is the norm. If they withdraw from you and do not fight against you and offer you peace, then God allows you no way against them. Very clear verses in the Quran. Now, uh, this is very important. Uh, when you read the Quran, uh, in terms of legal and ethical pronouncements, uh, it's about marriage, divorce, inheritance, and warfare. These three things are covered quite a bit of detail in the Quran. The reason is, this is where a lot of human beings do wrong things. You know, uh, when people are getting divorced, everything gets ugly. Mm -hmm. They start having child custody battles and you know, people who love each other become enemies, or can become enemies. Uh, inheritance. Family members perfectly, they love each other, they could maybe fight for each other, but when it comes to sharing asset, they, they're each other, at each other's throat and they don't talk to one another. And warfare. Warfare is just something else. Is another one that obviously you're getting into battle to kill somebody. And a lot of wrong things can be done. So Quran is talking about these things to give uh, guidelines, legal and ethical, uh, so that Muslims, at least Muslims, don't do anything wrong. And for this reason, when we look at Muslim history, you know, we don't see any um, genocides, holocausts, you know, Muslims going in, uh, invading a country and, and killing the indigenous people. We don't see any of that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Alright, how about terrorism then? How can, if, if jihad is so restrained, restricted, how can some people engage in terrorism? Uh, we, we first have to define it, and this is from New South Wales Police. It says that an extremist is a person who passively supports the advancement of a political, religious, or ideological cause through threats of violence and violent action. A radical is a person who is prepared to take action. That's the difference between extremism and radical radicals. Uh, while extremists may support as an idea, uh, radicals are prepared to take action in that. So, um, characteristics of a terrorist act is that violence is aimed to inflict human casualties and to destroy public and private property. 
and the target is usually unsuspecting civilians, so that they generate a, a shock effect. And I just said that in Islam, uh, this is you cannot touch civilians. Even uh, in Islamic law, there is a crime called hiraba. You know, hiraba was like banditry uh, or attacking civilians, stealing their property and killing them. Uh, the the punishment for this is the execution, capital punishment. Uh, and that was the, that was considered a terrorist act. Uh, and punishable by death. And perpetrators claim to represent a cause or people and political objectives against policies or some actions of a government entity. This doesn't look like a very religious thing, is it? In its nature. It doesn't sound like it. Uh, the definition of a Muslim, uh, you may have heard this in your Pause, uh, through the mosque. <coughs> it means a person who has surrendered himself to God in deep faith and, a, and as a result found inner peace. The very definition of the word Muslim is about submission, being submissive. Um, submissive as in like you let yourself, you submit to God so that God transforms you to be a better person that kind of a devotional submission. However, a terrorist is a person who generates terror within civilian population through illegitimate use of violence and probably terrorize within themselves. I mean, I've met some radical people, you know, I was talking to them to try to persuade them to change their thinking. Believe me, they're not peaceful people. They have great problems as individuals themselves. I, I, I cannot recognize any sign of Islam or true submission in them, other than maybe they look like a Muslim, they're dressed like with the beard, the, the turban and the long dress. Uh, they, they have the visual appearance of a Muslim, um, but uh, I can't recognize any true Islam in their heart. This is the images that come up when we type Islamic fundamentalism in, on the internet, Google. Look at that, guns, people shouting. Uh, well, there is also other fundamentalism, but at least in the, in the case of Christian fundamentalism, no violence comes up. It's about homosexuality and, and, and abortion and other things. Can Armstrong, a, an American author who writes a lot about this, she talks about, in terms of fundamentalism, deep resentment to the negative elements of modern life and a real fear that secularism will eventually eliminate the role of religion in society. So people who are fundamentalists are, are worried and they're fearful that religion will disappear unless they do something about it. So, uh, so this is an important distinction which explains why people may be uh, radical and extreme. I just want to give you some facts. Now a lot of the discussion about terrorism is rhetoric, emotion, uh, rather than facts. There is an American professor, Robert Payne, he's written a book called Cutting the Foods, the ex explosion of global suicide terrorism and how to stop it. And he's done two editions to this book. One, he looked at all suicide bombings from 1980 till 2004. And he says there were two, 345 attacks. 50% uh, of these suicide bombings were done by secular groups. So they weren't religious people. And Tamil Tigers, which was in Sri Lanka, a Buddhist group, topped the list of suicide bombings. And many people don't know that. Um, and Kurdish group, there's a, a Kurdish group called PKK, uh, they carry out more than one third of all suicide attacks. And they are a, a kind of like a socialist, Marxist, Leninist kind of a, a group. They're not, they're not religious at all. They even, when, when recruits come in and they pray, they tell them not to pray. 
and 95% uh, and of the attacks uh, were done to compel the withdrawal of occupying forces. So there's a, what Robert Pape and his colleague is saying that there's a link between this acts of terrorism and occupation. Or kind of a perception that their land, what belongs to them, has been occupied by some other government or forces. Now, you might say, oh, okay, 2004, uh, there was no, there was, I think that was just after the invasion of Iraq, they had 9-11, but after that, so many other things happened, right? Suicide bombings, what about them? And usually these are in Muslim countries like Pakistan, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and so on. So Robert Pape and his colleague went and looked at the data again, and this time there were, 1,800 suicide bombings. <coughs> so in that six years, suicide bombings skyrocketed. 87% of these were in Iraq and Afghanistan. And 12% in Pakistan. And as you know, Iraq was invaded and Afghanistan was also invaded. I'm not saying here, you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not justifying terrorism. And uh, Robert Payne also says we're not justifying. We just want to know what's the cause of this terrorist uh, attack. Uh, and uh, so Iraq was invaded. Afghanistan was also invaded. Uh, from here, when we look at it from Australia, we can see, oh, okay, yeah, look, if these Afghan people, if they just stay quiet for a while, Americans and other coalition forces will just leave. Right? So the smart thing to do is, not to do anything, right? I, I can see that. But if you're a person who's in Afghanistan, who's not exposed to uh, these things, all they see is just forces everywhere, and, and there's some fiery imam or ref, some tribal leader who says, we have to defend our country. They're, they're coming, invading that, stealing our resources, or whatever. This may be true or may not be true. But then these people say, oh, OK, we have to defend our country. We don't have weapons, we don't have an army, we'll just go and bomb ourselves. Uh, this is the rationale of these people. And even the suicide bombings in Afghanistan occurred after 2006 surge. Uh, you, may, you, don't, you may know this or you may not know this, but Taliban was positioned in some places in Afghanistan and coalition forces targeted them with drone attacks. And once again, people see bombs coming in and they're thinking they're being occupied, so I have to go and defend my country. Uh, amongst the non-locals, many bombers connected to the land and its people. So suicide bombers are usually always from the same country, or there's a minority of people who have a relationship with that country. <coughs> uh, so, Pape, Robert Pape says that there's a deep anger at the presence of Western combat forces in Muslim lands. And you see this in language. Ayman Zawahiri, you know, he's one of the ideologues of Al-Qaeda. He says, you made rivers of blood in our countries, so we blow up volcanoes in yours. That's, that's a very angry person. Uh, but when someone is <coughs> in angry and they're in rage, you can't reason with them. I don't know if this happened to you, to yourself, or you've seen a family member to do it. When they're angry, you can't reason. This is the kind of the state these uh, people are. Um, so there is a process to this radicalization. And this is very important how it, it happens. Now, firstly, there is a territorial occupation, an actual or a perceived suffering. This creates uh, rage and anger. And if you're not angry, let's say Al-Qaeda wants to recruit uh, some people and they've, they've got 20 people in the room. And these people are just sitting there, 17 year olds, 19 year olds, they're not very angry, right? So what first thing they do is they show them videos, images of suffering of Muslims under occupation to get them angry uh, and enraged. And then anger and rage creates a strong desire to retaliate and seek revenge. 
And then comes the ethical dilemma. Uh, you know, there's an ethical dilemma there. You know, okay, well, I'm not supposed to kill civilians, right? It is love. But I want to. I'm very angry at these people are invading. They're killing our civilian people too. So this causes what we call in psychology cognitive dissonance. When you have two opposing uh, views in your mind, one of them has to go. And you can't guarantee which one. So this is when ha what happens is uh, they search for religious taste to rationalize impulse to retaliate. And the, the recruit has to, doesn't have to do anything. The Al-Qaeda ideologues provide it for them. Says, so look, there's this verse in the Quran that is saying of Prophet Muhammad, you can do this, it's okay. To remove that doubt in their mind. Um, so exposure to extreme radical views combined with a twisted logic solves the problem. Uh, and then a person is recruited and they're prepared to commit violent acts. And on top of that, what they do is they show videos of success stories. You know, you've seen that 17-year-old Australian kid? Uh, have you seen that image? He was uh, giving a fire rhetoric with machine gun in his hand with a wall of uh, with ISIS fighters in the back. You know, you saw that. You know, that was a perfect publicity stunt. Uh, and the whole world media fell right into it. They weren't trying to give a message to America or England or anything like that. They, that message was to other young people out there. And everyone fell right into it. It was everywhere, in newspapers, TV. And this, what do you think, at home, as another 17-year-old uh, Muslim guy sitting there and watching this? When he is put down by his parents, he goes to school, he's put down by his uh, teachers, he goes outside, he's discriminated against, and here you go, there's a 17-year-old who's treated like a hero. Right? But unfortunately, it fell right into it. Then, just recently, four other guys went. And who knows how many others went, and we don't know about So, this is all a recruiting thing. Uh, so, they want to celebrate, they call it success, they call it, you matter. You young people matter, you make a difference. We are here fighting with Islamic uh, state. Islamic, it's Islamic. Everything's going to be beautiful. Obviously not, because uh, I don't think it is. Uh, but people get convinced by these arguments. Uh, they are they are attracted to these things. It's like an adventure. It's like a solution. But so we, what we have to do is we have to be very careful. As reasonable people, Muslims or non-Muslims. In our society, we have to work together to combat radicalization, but also Islamophobia. Some of these things, unfortunately, Islamophobic um, the rhetoric damages a lot of the good work that is done. I just want to stop there and uh, and uh, maybe if you have any questions, maybe ask answer your question. It's a fabulous presentation. Uh, has that presentation been seen by by uh, uh, opinion leaders in uh, in Sydney? And uh, uh, for example, we've got uh, our state federal members that have been here earlier. Uh, I think that'd be very important for them to get a copy of that. Uh, uh, that I'd love to mind. give it to them or make the presentations before. Leaders, but we don't always get a chance. I know. Uh, if somebody can organize that, that would be fantastic. Uh, I, I have spoken before some parliament, but not all. For uh, 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 the media is important. Uh, we are engaging media. I've met with editors of Sydney Morning Herald uh, and, and other journalists, but but never uh, in, in a I don't think we have reached a critical mass of information, education, and the... We'll see what we can do. Well, that would be great, thank you. Yes. 
mountainous regions in Iran, Afghanistan, the entire Muslim world was colonized by, uh, by European powers. Uh, like when we look at Egypt, for instance, Egypt uh, in the uh, 19th century was developing. Uh, they, they, they were quite progressive. Uh, they even built Suez Canal in 1869. Suez Canal was open. You know Suez, what does Suez Canal mean? We can have access to world trade far more quickly. And obviously that became very important in geopolitics of the day. And, and Egypt was declared a, a colony of Britain in 1882. Um, we look at, uh, like in Ottoman Empire, Iran, Egypt, uh, Istanbul, constitutional republic. So, like parliaments were established in late 19th century or early 20th century. But they sort of kind of failed. So what I'm saying is that Muslims uh, are struggling. Uh, they've done, they were now in the post-colonization era. Uh, the changes are happening. But as you said, uh, you cannot blame people forever. You have to just work. You have to start saying, okay, where did we go wrong? How can we fix it? And then work hard. Make jihad. We need to make, we need to make intellectual jihad. We need to make social jihad, you know, make life, give people more rights, fight for our rights. Before all these uh, political or military things should, should be considered, there's a lot, a lot more can be done. Yes. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Ali for this very good speech. And uh, uh, particularly in uh, the uh, uh, area of jihad, terrorism, suicide bombing, Sunderland, this very sensible and uh, uh, very uh, important topics currently in the world. Uh, uh, what we can, Professor Azal, uh, expect in the future? Will this uh, terrorism, uh, suicide bombing, and jihad, something like that, uh, will increase or decrease very well, uh, okay. What is dependent of? <laughs> I think I think that uh, we entered into a whole new era where Muslims are being trialed against Muslims. Before it was all about Muslims against, let's say, West, right? Uh, the world powers, and but now it's changing. It's, Muslims against other Muslims. I think there will be more, uh, I'm not sure if violence, but there will be oppressive uh, policies in Muslim countries against other Muslims. But all of this is a, is a learning thing. So unfortunately, sometimes you learn through a hard way. Trial and error, you see, you try something and it doesn't work, it makes things worse, so you change it. This is how uh, the Western world came to democracy. Like there were massive bloody wars in Europe, you know, uh, 80 year wars and 100 year wars and, um, and, and people between denominations, you know, Christian denominations were fighting. And eventually they, they said, look, this is enough. We, we can't get anywhere. We, we have to respect one another.
my role in Chancellor. Yeah, what, what is I'm the director of director of Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization that was established in 2009. We have an undergraduate and postgraduate masters of course on Islamic Studies. Uh, and we have about 350 students, so it's doing well. But in spite of that, 
there was a, a, a national football day that was organized, that came out of that discussion, where uh, every mosque in Australia were asked to uh, condemn terrorism and, and uh, advise the congregation not to be associated with radicals and so on. There was a national mosque open day uh, some couple of weeks ago now. Uh, but, but still, the community is working very hard. Uh, but uh, the other thing that comes up in meetings like this, there's always one or two people say, why do we have to apologize for somebody who we have no association with, uh, somewhere else in the world? I mean, why do we have to apologize for that, like they, they think? Exactly. This is a, a, an important point, uh, uh, which, which generates, I think it should, we need to investigate this. Why do Muslims have to do that? But I also know that Australians want to hear Muslims here to say, oh, we don't conduct these things. I can also understand that too. So the job is not very easy. I think this is why I'm calling on collaboration. Uh, you know, a true collaboration by authorities, governments, social groups, your uh, commission, uh, Muslim organizations. We have to think about win-win solutions. Because when we, sometimes when we sit down you know, with the government officials, uh, all they're worried about is radicalization. They just want to stop that. The Muslims say, yeah, but there's this Islamophobia problem, which is uh, making our lives uh, really hard, and it also fuels radicalization. <coughs> they don't want to hear it. They just want to hear, stop radicalization. And Muslims here, they just want to stop Islamophobia. And you get nowhere. There's impasse. You don't have proper discussion to, and, uh, because Good solutions require really sincere, genuine discussion. So what can we really do here? I'm sure we can do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things if we can build trust between Muslim community and the public. Yes, but uh, what causes a difference between uh, Sunni and Shia uh, Muslims? What causes the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims? We need another presentation for that. <laughs> There, is a, there, was a historic, there were some historic events in the 7th century about the leadership. Um, who could lead Muslims after Prophet Muhammad? They were four rightly guided caliphs, but they were successors. And they sort of kind of generally accepted. But uh, people had preferences over leadership and what they meant by leadership. Some Muslims thought leaders should have a religious role and a more like an executive role, administrative role, together. Well, others thought, no, uh, religion should not be represented by a fallible leader. Scholars are the leaders. So kind of Sunnis were thinking like that, you know, uh, the religion should only be represented by scholars. Uh, and the caliph, whoever it is, just the political leader. But the Shiites thought, no, it has to be only religious and, uh, thank you, it should be, it has to be religious and uh, executive. And because of that, they have to be pure people. They, have, they can only be the relatives of Prophet Muhammad. For the Shiite Muslims accept the leaders to be only from the household of the Prophet Muhammad. And others, others thought, well, that's not practical or realistic or even useful. So that gen it was a political difference in that early era that created some factions within the Muslim community. And later on these things became had some uh, theological things back in uh, centuries later. Um, I mean in Muslim like Shiites and Sunnis lived peacefully for centuries. Like there was no until 16th century, there was peaceful sort of coexistence. I mean, yeah, you may disagree with them, but uh, there was no oppression either way. But like, sometimes Shiites became rulers. They tolerated Sunnis, and Sunnis became rulers and tolerated Shiites. But in 16th century in Iran, uh, with the Shah Ismail, uh, it became a little bit oppressive against Sunnis. And then ever since, there was some bit more tension. 
and also the Ottoman Empire and the Iran, they were sort of fighting each other uh, over supremacy and that also created rift. Uh, in our time, uh, I don't know, we can go into that, but uh, a lot of the problem is caused by, once again, this invasion. Right? Before invasion of Iraq, there was no problem between Sunnis and Shahs. They were marrying each other. They even defended the, the country against the British occupation in the, in the independence of Iraq. Um, so it looked okay, you know, under Saddam Hussein. But as soon as the invasion occurred, there was one mistake made by, unfortunately, America in that they thought that, ah, oh, okay, Saddam Hussein is Sunni, uh, so Shiites must be against him. So if we support the Shiites, uh, then we'll have, a, we'll have support within Iraq. They'll, they'll meet us with flowers, you know. On the, uh, but it was a mistake. And, uh, uh, and it, it didn't generate the kind of things that they hoped for. Uh, and because of that, the Sunnis felt they were discriminated against. Uh, and, and who knows, like, there's a lot of Al-Qaeda saw this as an opportunity. Ah, oh, yeah, uh, let's throw a bomb in a Shiite mosque. Uh, and they'll throw a bomb in a Sunni mosque and we'll create problem. And in, within that, we'll get rid of a, rid of a supremacy. Uh, and I have, you may not know, but ISIS was established in Iraq. First, it was established in Iraq. It was the Al Qaeda chapter in Iraq. Uh, but after uh, what was his name? The uh, he was killed. The Baghdadi came in there, and then they went to Syria because this they stabilized. They thought, hey, we can establish a state here. It's a, in the middle of nowhere, no man's land. No one's in charge. There's no authority. Uh, it just raised uh, 1,000 people. You can take over Mosul, two million population. So the conditions were right for this kind of things to come out, unfortunately. Okay, maybe we should stop there. Yeah. That brings us to the end of our Moscow Day event.